Welcome. It's such a beautiful day today. We're having a heat wave throughout Europe. It's the middle of July. It's usually warm here, but not like this. It's almost 35 degrees today, <laughs> which I like very much. Today we're going to talk about table lamps. Over the years, I've been doing a lot of table lamps. Uh, most of them I've been doing in pit fire. Uh, and it originally came up because as a default, there are some limitations with pit fire. It's not completely waterproof, it's not food safe, unless you use some special sealants, which I have found out, and um, I put up a video about it, there's a link somewhere here, go watch that. But as a default, pit fire is not food safe, it's not waterproof, so I'm thinking, what can you make in pit fire where that's not really a requirement? And then the idea of table lamps came up. And as it turned out, the pit fired pot uh, it's just beautiful for table lamps uh, because, of course, the light uh, glows down on it and actually increases the, 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 the intensity of the colors. So it's a very good uh, way of using uh, pit fire. Today I'm going to show you how you make a table lamp from throwing it and adjusting it and making that uh, the, the, the holes you need for the electric fittings and stuff and how you fit that until you have the final lamp. The one I'm going to do today, at least one of them, is going to be Raku fired uh, instead of pit fired. Maybe one of them will go in the pit as well. But the process is the same. So um, let's get on with it. First, of course, as always, you have to decide uh, which clay you're going to use. I'm using uh, this high iron uh, stoneware um, that actually have a lot of grog in it. It's 40%, but it's very fine, so I can make it very, very smooth. It looks good and um, it works well for both pit fire and raku. And I think I'm going to raku fire this one, so this is good. For the glaze that I'm using, I like a white surface though, so I'm probably going to apply some uh, slip, white slip, to give it a better surface for my glaze. For pit fire, I actually found out that this uh, rather dark clay actually turns some really beautiful pots too. Um, so let's get on with this. Oh yeah, another thing. This is about two and a half kilos, so about five pounds. Um, I don't like my my, um, my 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 lamps to be too light because once you add the bulb and the shade and stuff, uh, it has to stand, you know. And it's not something you're gonna move around too much anyway. So I don't think it should be too light. So I'm gonna use this rather big chunk of clay. So let's get on with that. So now we have it centered. For a table lamp, uh, you don't want the base to be too narrow because again, it's gonna tip around if, if it is. Now I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna open it up all the way down to the bed because you wanna have a reasonably sized hole where you can fit your hand or tools or whatever you need to add the electric fittings, especially in the top, that can be challenging. But when you are um, going down to the bed, you still wanna leave some clay at the sides, because if it's too little, um, then, it, then you risk that it glides off your bed. So I'm gonna make it like a, a small curve and then a hole big enough to get my hand in, hopefully. <laughs>
The shape I'm aiming for here is a slightly uh, a round uh, button and a not a super thin neck, but thinning in. Uh, if you make the neck too thin, I mean, it can look really beautiful with a long thin neck, but that's going to make it very difficult to um, to get up and add the fittings. So I'm trying not to make it too thin, but still, so it looks kind of elegant. So now I think I have sort of the basic shape that I like. Um, so now I need to decide how to close it up here because you need to close it and then make a hole for the fittings uh, for the light bulb. The two ways that you can do this, either you can make a small dish, um, dice <laughs> or dish it's called I think, and put it on top and seal it. Or you can extend your, 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 your neck a little bit and then close it off. And um, I prefer to do the last one because I think it, it kind of glues together better uh, that way. Um, anyway, the important thing is that you don't make the, the top too thick because that's going to be difficult to, um, to make the fitting fit. Um, and, um, and also it needs to be completely flat. So um, let's first extend um, the top a little bit. So that's about it. I'm going to extend just the top of it a little bit more because I want to have enough clay to um, kind of close the lid. So now I'm just going to bend it inwards. Closed it very slowly, making the hole smaller and smaller. <laughs> Until my fingers can't go in there anymore.
So. That's it. Now I have the basic shape and I have the top. The last thing I want to do is make sure that the top is completely flat because unless it is, then, then it can be a little bit um, uneven when you when you add your, um, your electric fittings. So that's it. I will um, be removing a little bit of the, of the foot here to perfect the shape, but I'm just going to leave it like this for now and do the rest in, um, in the trimming. So now I'm just going to leave it um, to dry to a leather hard stage. And once that's done, we will make the hole for the, for the fitting and the hole down here for the cord. And then we're ready to bisque fire it. Things are drying really fast in this uh, heat that we currently have. Um, so um, I had to leave it overnight because it was getting too late. I wrapped it up in plastic to make sure that it didn't dry too much, but it's still on the dry side of leather hard. The most uh, difficult part will be to make the hole in the top. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of, um, of water to this to hopefully dissolve it a little bit. Also, for whatever reason, when things dry, it can just uh, tip a little bit to one side or the other. Um, and since I want the hole to be right in the middle, it's important that the top is centered. Um, so I'm just going to try and see if I can. Yeah, see now the top is completely centered, which is important. So unlike what I would normally do, I will actually start um, cutting a hole in the top. This is um, this is probably the most difficult part of um, of uh, of doing these table lamps. The first thing I want to make sure is that the top is completely even. And uh, to make sure that it is, I'm going to use a trim tool like this, um, with a flat flat uh, uh, trim, and just. Lightly scrape it off here. If it's not completely flat, then uh, there's a risk that the, that the electric part for the light bulb um, is going to be a little bit uneven. That doesn't look good. So we want to make sure that it's completely flat. I think that looks good. Next thing you need to, um, I'm just looking because this one. Next thing you have to figure out what kind of fitting you're going to use for um, the light bulb. I'm using these fittings um, that's very standard here in Denmark. I don't know what you have. Um, they can be all the kinds of, of fitting it, but this is what I use. So I need a hole that fits this. It needs to fit it so there can be a little bit of wriggling, but not too much, because that's going to make it harder to um, to mount. On the other hand, you also have, on the other side, you also have to um, take into account shrinkage. So it has to be at this stage a little bit bigger than this. So basically, what I do, and and it's important that it's right in the center. This is a difficult part. So what I will start doing is I will sort of mark what the size is just as a rough guide. So now I know roughly that it's about it's about this size. And then I'm going to turn it and I'm going to just softly mark it with a knife because that way I can make sure that it's centered. Next I'm going to check that it's still completely in center and it is. And then I will use a needle tool to cut through in the groove that I made with the knife. And this is a little bit tricky because this clay is a little bit too dry. It's going to take slowly and 
cut myself through. And this is uh, also why you don't want this top to be um, to be too thick. Um, it just makes it more difficult to cut. Yeah, this is not easy. To, it, it should have been a little more wet. So now I'm through. Um, just gonna clean it up with the knife. So that looks good. Now I'm just gonna see if um, if my fitting fits. And yeah, that looks good. It fits. There's a little bit of space, less than a millimeter, and I think that's uh, good. You can always grind it um, after you bisque fire if it if it turned too small, but it's difficult to make it smaller if it's too big. So I like to keep it on the tight side of it. So now I'm just gonna uh, trim the part. I'm just gonna give it a light trim because as I said, it is kind of heavy now, but I like it to, to stand well. I'm gonna undercut the foot a little bit and I'm just gonna clean up for many throwing marks or anything. So it's not gonna be too much. So now I have the basic uh, trimming and the shape that I like. Um, as I mentioned, this one is going to be rock fired. And for the particular glaze that I'm going to use, it actually looks best if the surface is white. And this is going to bisque uh, pretty dark. So uh, I like a white surface. But I only want the glaze to be on the middle part. Uh, the top and the bottom I'm going to leave and that will be carbonized so it will be completely black really beautiful deep black and then the the color um, will be in the middle the crackle uh, turkish um, color so to do that i'm gonna i'm gonna cut some marks and then i will um, use a white slip uh, to um, cover the middle part of the surface So now I have some um, guides and it's all, also going to work as a nice visual um, framing of that, that, that color in the middle. So now we will um, add, or I will add the, um, the white slip. This time I'm just going to use a commercial slip that uh, I got from a local supplier. You can mix your own slip, it's, it's easier. Just have some of this um, and I know that it, it, it works well. Um, I will have to add at least a couple of layers to make it completely white. Um, I'm just going to start with the first layer. I'm going to use a small brush for um, the edges, which is always most difficult to get right. a bigger brush for the rest of it. As you can see, it's not completely covered yet. Um, that's okay. Uh, I need to add at least cover covers. So 
to make it a little bit faster, I will just quickly uh, dry it with my bow. So that's good enough. <clears throat> just needed to be dry enough to um, to be able to make the next uh, layer. So, that's it. Now we are ready to, um, to let it dry. And um, the only thing left is, um, because I want to keep the top, um, I want to keep the top uh, uh, unglazed and just let it uh, turn black in the, in the reduction chamber. Um, for that um, reason, I want it to be as polished as possible. Now there's two ways that you can um, you can go about that. Um, either you can um, just hold on a second. I just want to clean up this. Um, let's hold a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Um, there are two ways you can go. Either you can you can polish it, um, and since you're on the wheel, it's quite easy. I use a small polishing stone and just turn really really fast, and then. The tricky part is to, to do it at the right dryness stage. I have to be um, a little more than the leather heart, which is in this case is good. Um, because if it's too soft, then you're going to leave some, uh, some marks from the stone. But now, as I turn this, I'm actually pressing down the small particles into the clay, which will then leave the surface very, very shiny. The other way, I could also add that now, would be to um, use terracicolata. Um, in this case, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm just going to leave it um, this. And as you can see, it is actually quite shiny now. Um, so I think that will turn nice um, with, the, with the reduction. Um, So that's it. Now we need to turn it and, um, and finish the button and make a hole for the cable to come out. Because, I mean, you, you can have fittings where the cable come out in the top. I don't think it looks so good. It's nice to have the cable coming out here and you can kind of hide it in furniture or whatever. So now we need to cut loose. And remember, there's a big hole in the button, so you only have the rim. So be a little bit careful when you cut off uh, pieces like this.
That's it. It's actually surprisingly light, I would say. So um, now we need to trim this. I'm just going to put it aside for a second. Now we don't actually need to trim the foot as such, the way that you would normally trim. Uh, and we definitely need some sort of a chuck for this because it is a long neck. Unfortunately, I don't have a real chuck for this size. Um, so I'm just gonna use a pot. So um, I think this one's gonna work. So in order not, so in order not to mess up my my newly burnished um, top, I'm just gonna leave this um, piece of cloth here. Um, it's gonna protect it, um, and if I had to do real turning um, and trimming, I would probably need more stable solution. But for what we're gonna do here, yeah, this is this is good enough. I'm using this, um, I don't know what you call a leveler. This is actually uh, from a, a camping shop. You can also buy it in ceramic shops, I think some places, or photoshops, very expensive. If you buy it in a camping shop, this was like half a dollar or something, very cheap. But this uh, is secure that the level is correct. So you just basically put it on the top and then you can see when the, when the little dot is in the middle, then it's perfect. So that's it, and um, I also want to just do a little bit of adjustment so it's relatively in the middle. I'm going to mess this around anyway. As you see, we have this uh, big hole here, and you can also see there's a little bit of that um, curve that I told you about, not to leave the very thin edge. Um, so I want to get rid of some of that. There's, there's no need for that now, and um, I want to drill the, the hole and just want to uh, burnish the, um, the, the, the bottom too so we get a really nice and shiny surface here. So to do that I'm not going to do normal trimming. I could like uh, turning around slowly and um, just use a knife to slowly get this, um, this piece off. But nobody's going to see this. So, so it's, not, it's not a visual visually important thing. Um, I just want to get rid of some of this. So it's a little bit difficult to um, to film it as I do it. So I'm just gonna put the camera back and I will, I will trim this and I will show you how it looks in the end. There's also, when I, when I do it like this, there's also typically a little too much clay in here, so I'll try and take some of that out. Maybe I will use a trimming tool. And of course, some of all these trimmings are going to end up at the bottom, the top of the lamp here. And um, if you can, just pull it out. If not, then just leave it until it's dry. Because if you try to, to move it, it's just going to work its way into the clay and then that's um, it's not good. Of course now it jumped around a little bit, but that doesn't matter. Because we're not trimming a foot, um, as I said. So, um, let me just get this right again. Oh, now the hole is too big for it. <laughs> so, um, you can actually put uh, something over it, but it, it, it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, the last thing, I'm just going to lightly um, touch the edge so that I know it's completely flat. And, and that's it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't need to be uh, more than this. Um, so um, now there's only the burnishing left and, um, and the hole. So for this top, of course, I can't turn it as fast as I did at the bottom, but um, I can still you know, 
just make sure that I don't drop it or anything. And also I can feel that this is a little more soft, so I can't put as much pressure on as I would like. I think actually, I'm just gonna leave it like this. You can always go back when it's a little more dry and then, then they burnish it a little more. And, um, and now I see, this always happens, you know, I got a little bit of, um, of the clay here, um, so it's not, it's not so super white. I will just touch it up with the brush in the end. But now I want to drill the hole and I have um, for that a, a hole cutter. It just needs to be big enough to, um, to bring the cable in. So we're just going to hold it here and uh, find the right spot and support it on the back and then drill it through. Just you know, mark it. Um, just make sure that it looks nice on the inside and the outside, and that there's no sharp edges that potentially could um, could damage the cable. So that's it. Um, all that's left for me is to um, stamp it with my maker's mark, um, and um, I got the one here. And um, I'm going to do it opposite um, of the cable, um, this is just me. So I stamped it and I made the hole here and um, just make sure that it, it's kind of soft, there's no sharp edges. Um, and then as you see I just cut it here a little bit, uh, removed excess clay, but I still left it um, kind of thick down here because as I said, I don't want it to be too light. So um, that's good. Now I just want to brush up these. I messed up this a little bit, but I'll just, uh, it's still uh, smooth. And so it's just a couple of small marks. I'll just, I'll just brush that up. So I think that's it. Now just gonna let it dry and bisque fire it, and then we're ready to do the rock fire. And uh, next we will do our last thing. We will um, add the fittings and um, get it ready to um, light up the room. Now the two lamp bases that I made um, are ready for bisque fire. I hope it goes well, and um, in a couple of days I will see the result of this, and then I will do the Rago firing. It's always exciting when you open your kiln. I will advise you to wait. I open it when it's about 100 degrees, just a little bit, and let it cool down a little more, 100 degrees Celsius. Now it's 65 degrees, and um, it's safe to open it. Safe for your pots, so they don't crack, something happens. And save for your kiln, so um, the electricity in there doesn't get um, get hurt by uh, thermal shocks. This time we have the lamp bases in there, and they should be fine. I'm not too worried about that. So um, now we'll just take them out and get ready for the rago fire of them. Yeah, that looks good. As expected. <laughs> we have the two lamp bases. They look perfect. The white came out really good. We still uh, sustain some of the shine. Uh, even though I did fire this a little bit higher than what most people do for bisque, it's fired to um, about 1000 degrees centigrade uh, Celsius. Um, but that's because I also have some stuff with Terra that I did have problems with um, and but you can see here it, it's not flaking off so it's good and I still have some shine. Um, so let's get them in, cool them down, get ready for the rock fire. Now we're ready to glaze. Um, I put it on the wheel because I can't really dip this one so I'm gonna brush it and um, 
The easiest way to brush something like this is to put it on the wheel. I'm going to use a very simple glaze, some call it Del Ferro Luster, or something like that. Uh, it's basically just a very simple Rago glaze, 80% um, Gersley Borat and 20% Cornerstone. And then there's a 2% um, Copper Carbonate, which uh, when it turns out right, uh, gives you this uh, nice turkey screen with some very, I don't know if you can see it here, some very nice uh, crackles. Um, so that's what I'm aiming for. When you put it on a dark clay, it will be completely different. So that's why I um, added this um, this uh, white um, slip. Um, so hopefully I will get something more similar to this one. I'm gonna give it a couple of layers. It's always tricky when you when you glaze it. Um, and with Gersley uh, there's Borat, there's a tendency that it gels up. Um, I just mix this up. I think sometimes when you whip a lot, um, otherwise you can defecate it. Um, if you don't know anything about that, uh, look it up. There's some good videos about defecation. So. Be careful not to uh, just add more water, because that's just going to thin it out and you're going to have less particles. Um, you may want to just uh, defecate it. This glaze takes quite a thick layer. Um, this is something you need to, to learn by experience, but generally speaking, these uh, Gersley Borat uh, Rago glazes do take um, a lot. And um, it's better to have a little bit too much and just make sure that it melts out when you, when you fire it, uh, than it is to have too little. So, I think this is good. I just want to go over it with a sponge, maybe a little bit of a knife, and make sure that nothing um, escaped <laughs> my, my, um, my boundaries here. So now we're ready to rock fire. Now I'm ready to fire my two lamp bases. They'll be rock fired. I already glazed them. So I put them in the kiln and I'm ready to turn on the heat. But before I started, there's a few things that you should prepare in advance. Of course, you need to prepare your, your reduction buckets. I'm going to put this into reduction so get a black top and bottom and uh, nice colors in the crackles. Um, but also you've got to prepare how you're going to move the hot pot from your kiln to the reduction chamber. So for this pot, I made a special tool. Because you see, Unlike other pots where you have like a, a, a neck of some kind where you could grab it, there's really nothing to grab here. I could have a tongue with some, some, something that could eat into it, but then there's a risk that I will, I will scratch it. And I really don't want to do that. So instead, I made this tool. <laughs> it looks very simple, and it is. It's just a stick where I put a screw on. Let me see if I can get it sharp. I put a screw on, and that screw fits perfectly into the pot. So now, when I'm ready, I can lift it up and I'm not gonna scratch the inside at all. And uh, maybe the wood would eventually burn away, but I mean, it's just cheap scrap wood. But this fits perfectly in here. I can lift it up very carefully and I can move it around. So now I'm ready to fire up. I will, as usual, go as slow as possible to begin with, um, and then I will slowly raise the pressure to get more heat. A 
as I mentioned before, when you want to check um, if the glaze is finished, you can't rely on just temperatures. But I'm using this as sort of a, uh, a check to see the speed of the, the, the how fast I raise the temperature and such, and also approximately where I am. I know this particular glaze likes to be 950, 1000 degrees Celsius, so around there it should be good. But I'm just using it as a guide. I will look into the hole and see when the glaze is uh, like an icy lake, water on an icy lake, when it's all melted and it's, uh, and it's uh, shiny. That's when it's ready. Now we're slowly getting close to the temperature where the uh, glaze is going to melt. Uh, it should probably be 50, 75 degrees more than this, but now I will start looking into it and see if it melts um, and when it's ready to pull. Uh, I can't really film in there <laughs> because it's so warm over the hole and uh, the camera will just fuck up and uh, not fuck, but fuck. <laughs> um, so uh, I will show you when I pull them. When I look inside the kill mount, I can look through the hole. If I'm very careful, <laughs> because it's very warm that air that comes up there, of course, you have to be careful. But when I look inside, I can now see that the glaze starts to bubble up. Uh, that's the first stage. Don't pull it there. <laughs> it's not ready yet. Uh, it needs to bubble up, melt out and then become completely uh, uh, smooth. And as I said before, it looks sort of like um, water on an icy lake. So shiny and smooth. You don't want any bubbles because those bubbles are gonna be there when you pull it, so, and, and it looks awful. So um, give it the last few minutes and, um, and we will pull it and see how it goes. Now the temperature is close to a thousand degrees. And uh, when I look into the kiln, it's melted. And it looks sort of icy now, so it's very, very close. It's a matter of minutes. Now, if you let it burn too long or too high temperature, there's a risk that the colors will uh, sort of burn away. So it's very tricky to get it out in exactly the right time. So now, as you can hear, <laughs> I turned off the gas. It looks good. So now it's time to uh, pull them out. I will give them a little bit of air and then uh, put them into the combustion, uh, combustion, combustion uh, chamber, <laughs> reduction, reduction bucket. Um, so let's see how that goes. It looks good inside. It's so warm, a thousand degrees. So now we'll pull them. Always wear gloves, of course. And now I'll see how my new stick, my new tongue, it's working. Just put it here for a second, and then we'll give it a little bit of air. It will help uh, create more cracks. Swing it around like that a little bit, and you can actually hear how it's cracking up. So, that's it. Now I'm just going to leave them there for half an hour or something.
Now the lamp bases have cooled down. I actually just let them stay in the can overnight. You can do that. I mean, they, they usually never get too much smoke or carbon. So now I want to see how it turned out. Yeah, what I like when I look now is that it's a beautiful black on the top. And when I polish that, it's going to be just perfect. So that's, that's a good thing. It's actually still a little bit warm, even though it's been all overnight. The crackles have not developed perfectly. They're still beautiful. Um, there's some, some um, carbon on, on, on the glaze. I will, I will polish that off. But all in all, I think it looks okay. It does have a few minor cracks. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a problem for this. Anyway, let's take a look at the other one. This one also have a beautiful dark top. This one does, however, have a little more of cracks. I think I may be able to glue this and, I mean, it is Rago, it does crack. <laughs> but this one has some more interesting um, cracks around it. And still this, this uh, dirt here, don't be afraid of that because you can wash that off. Also the shadows here. So I think, I think it was okay. Uh, maybe I should try with a different clay next time. Uh, I have a clay that um, can sustain much more uh, thermal shocks uh, called uh, Esraf Henna. It's also super white and um, maybe that would be better for this uh, sort of um, application. But I will clean them up and polish it and um, I'll show you the final results. And then of course we need to assemble um, the electronics, <laughs> uh, so it actually turns into a lamp. So I'll show you how you do that in a minute. Now I have finished the parts, so to speak. I have um, applied a layer of wax on the darker parts, so it kind of shines a little bit and it just looks nice. And I cleaned up the glaze. You always end up with a lot of this uh, dust and carbon and, and stuff that just makes it look dull. And so washed it and cleaned it and everything. And um, so they're ready now for the fittings. Unfortunately, one of them got a little bit of a crack. I don't know if you can see it. It's not that easy to see. And I glued it uh, with a strong epoxy glue. So it actually works, it's functional. And since this is not for food or to hold water or anything, it will work. Of course, I won't sell an item like this, but I think I may have applied a little bit too much of the, of the the air <laughs> that puts some, some thermal stress on the pot. But it looks good. And uh, so I'll just keep this. I'll give it to a friend or something. So now we're ready to um, add the electric fittings. And for that we need, of course, some cable. I like to use this black uh, cable. You can use any kind of cable that works for your uh, region. Uh, of course you need a light bulb. And you need a um, some sort of fitting for your um, light bulb. There are different kinds. I usually use this uh, cheap plastic one. It's not, I mean, when you look close at it, it's not very exclusive, nice. You can also get some in brass or copper and stuff, but it looks really good here. It's dark. And since I'm gonna have a shade on this, it's gonna cover it. So nobody's gonna see it. You can also get these uh, fittings in um, a ceramic material. They're actually much nicer, they're heavy and they, you know, they, they, they look more exclusive, but they do have a very dull kind of color. It, it, it wouldn't look good here. But what I found is that it's very easy to paint them. You can just uh, spray paint them in acrylic spray, in a black acrylic spray, and that way they will actually look um, much better. You can actually see, just hold on a second, I have one here. This is one of the pit fight lamps I did without a shade, but instead with a big light bulb. You can do that too. But this is um, this is the uh, same one as this, but I just gave it an acrylic spray. And, and you know, it looks good. And in this case, uh, it's visual because there's no uh, shade. So I wanted something that just feels a little better. So I used that one. Then of course, I like to use, not of course, but I like to have a switch on as well, on the cable. Uh, you don't need that. Um, I mean, you can turn it on and off. 
on your on your outlet. Um, then we need something a little more special. You can get that in in a in a builder's market or electric uh, shop or something. But all these um, they come with with a standard uh, uh, screw, and um, you put it in here. So tighten it, and then you put it into there, and then you can put a screw, small one here, on the inside. Now, that's where the first challenge comes in. <laughs> because I deliberately made these ones, because I tried before, big enough to fit my hand. And they don't have a long, narrow neck. So I can actually get all the way up and screw this on. But I also did one, uh, some of them, with longer, narrow necks. And that's when I found out my hand just can't fit in there. So for that, I also took this one. This is a, a tool, again, from my usual toolbox, that fits this screw. So that way you can put it in here. And even with a long neck, you can put this up and screw it. You could also just glue it on. Um, I don't like to do that uh, because I, would, I like to be able to remove it. If you need to change it, if there's some problems or something, if you glue it on, it's much more difficult, especially if you use like strong epoxy glue and you need that to hold the, the lampshade and stuff. So I don't, I don't, I don't use uh, glue. Um, but for this one, it's quite easy. So I'm just going to take it apart to start with. So then we can uh, add the electric fittings afterwards. I start with this, just the lower part. Put this in, fit in here. And it can be a little bit tricky, but it usually works. And it's a good idea to tighten it very much. I did that. So now we have the first part ready. Next part is to measure the, the cable. So we're just going to put it through here. And this is where the hole that we made, remember? This hole in the side, that's where this comes handy. So we're gonna put this out here. But we're actually just gonna do it temporary. Did I make the hole too small? I don't hope so. <laughs> Let me see. It's actually a little bit tight. You know what? That's a good example of what you can do. Hold this. With this tool, file, I guess it's called, um, it's actually quite easy to grind uh, the hole a little bit bigger. Because it's really not that much. There was just a little bit of leftover. So now, now the cable can hopefully get through. I do like to make it tight because I don't like it to be too big of a hole. So now, now it looks good, it just comes out on the side. And that's why I, I like the black cable, because it looks good here. So now we have to figure out how much cable you want. And of course, that's a matter of, of preference. Um, I like to have enough to get to my clock, but not so much that I walk around. Anyway, I think a little bit more. I think I think this is gonna be okay. Since we're gonna put um, this one on, you can always you know extend it if you find out you want it. But I'm actually gonna take it out again because I now it, the cable goes directly up here and it connects to these small connectors. Um, and so if you pull the lamp, of course you should do that, but you could by mistake do that. It will it will put stress on this cable. So what I like to do is tie a knot. It's, I mean, you can get all kinds of fancy fittings and stuff for this, but 
I don't really think there's any need for it. Um, this so I pull a little more cable because what I do is I just basically tie a knot like this this because that won't get through um, the hole so now we have sort of secured it um, and I just found that this is uh, this is good. So, so now we can oh this one. So now we can put the cable through. And as you see, I don't know if you see it, but the knot kind of uh, puts a a a stop to the cable so it won't pull into the top. So that was the first part. Now we need to um, assemble this um, electric part and re remember the right order to do it um, because this one has to go through. Um, so I'm just going to cut it. I think, I think about here. It's always a little bit tricky to mount this and it probably is different from each um, uh, fitting to another. So you have to check it out before you assemble it, because I mean, you can take it apart and do it again, but it's easier to do it the right way to begin with. So in this case, this one has to be put in the lower part after you mount uh, the, the cable, and then you screw this on and then it's ready. So what we need to do now is um, we need to um, adjust this. I think it's a little bit too high, so I think I need to cut it about here. Um, and then you're going to remove the rubber. I have this uh, wonderful tool to remove the plastic from the cable. It does it like in one go and then um, goes like this and then it's uh, free and um, it's nice cut. You can also do it with this one or some people do it with their teeth. I don't like to do that. But now we're ready to mount. Um, the shoe and I already unscrewed, uh, I don't know if you can see it, you need to unscrew these ones so there's actually a hole in there otherwise you won't be able to get the cable in. So I'm just gonna mount. Sometimes it helps to like um, wind the, the, the copper wires inside a little bit so they don't mess around too much. So we put this one in, we tighten the screw and it's so small. And after you tighten it, check that there's not any free cable sticking out that, and that it's actually tight. Um, you want that. It's better to check it now than, than later. Maybe put the second one in. It looks good. Again, tighten the screw. So now they're both tight. Now you can pull uh, the cable from the inside and then find the right, uh, usually have to fit into some sort of a slot here. Um, yep, there it goes. This is the right. You can feel it when, when it kind of jumps into it. So now it's uh, perfect and we can uh, screw on the top. And the lamp light bulb can go in. So that was the basic of this part of the fitting. Now we need to um, to do the other end of the cable. So basically now you need to decide how long you, you want it uh, before you add the, the, the connector. And I think in my case, I think I'll add the connector here. So I'm just gonna cut the cable and remove the plastic. Go. That was the outer plastic. Now we remove the inner. And again, I'm going to turn this. Um, it's because it's a lot of small, in case you never work with cable, it's a lot of small uh, wires. Um, and by, by twisting them, 
it's easier to attach it. And then, then we have the other end of it. Can do the same thing. So now we have these two ends ready for the connect or the switch. And these ones, <clears throat> they also come in all kinds of different shapes. This is just, you know, a local one that I found uh, works well for me. So um, you take them apart and um, you take inside how, how they work. Also, in, in Denmark, it's uh, legal to uh, do this sort of electric work as long as it's um, outside of the wall, so to speak. So you can't mount cables into your wall unless you're an authorized uh, electrician. Uh, but anything that's outside of the wall, such as la light, uh, uh, a lamp like this, or you know, ex external cables, you're legally allowed to, to do it yourself. Um, inside here, there's usually this um, where the cable comes in. Let me see if we can get a sharp, where the cable comes in. And this, uh, uh, same way as the knot I tied inside, it, it will hold the cable so it doesn't, it doesn't put any stress on, on the actual connector. And then the same thing in the other end. And, you know, depending on, on which market model you have, they, they may be, be different. And, and sometimes, <laughs> to be honest, they can be quite tricky. Um, I use this a lot of times, so I know how it works. So now I unscrewed um, the, the plate that holds the cable and I opened up the holes in the, the connectors for, um, for the copper. And so, yeah, again, that, this, is, this is very, very tricky. Um, it's very small, <laughs> but I got this one in. And again, just not push it too much or pull it too much, but just feel that it's 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 tightened and connected, because again, it's it's it can really be a, a nightmare to debug, um, because if if it doesn't light up when I connect it, is it this connector, is it that connector, or is it the last connector into the to the wall? Um, that's difficult to know, um, and um, it's just a lot easier if you get it right the first time. So now I got both of them mounted and now I just need to uh, remount this little plate that will um, hold the cable in place. Now we need to um, connect the, the power plug and uh, you can usually remove these two little pins. Uh, it's a lot easier to mount it that way and um, so just take them out of the box and mount the cable and screw them in, tighten them securely, and then put them back in. That's, uh, I found that's the easiest way to do it. I'm pretty sure that a professional electrician would probably laugh at me and say I'm doing it all wrong, but it works. Tighten it. And the same thing for the other one. So now they are both tightened. And now we can, um, Put them into the box, so they kind of like click into place. Oh, yeah, now it falls out, of course. But um, like this, and um, the last thing we need to do is put the same um, cable protector. Um, I don't know what it's actually called. I'm not an electrician, in case you wonder. <laughs> um, and then we will mount these ones. Now we're almost ready. It's always very exciting when you when you get to this stage and have to see um, light in your lamp for the first time, and you worked for like weeks or maybe even months um, creating this lamp. And um, yeah, so now we just have to put the lid on. And of course, screwed um, in place. And 
now it should work. So let's try and see that. So now comes a big time to see if it works. Wish me luck. Yeah, it did. <laughs> so last step is um, lampshade or not. I mean, I kind of like this too. You can get all kinds of funky uh, light bulbs today and they're all of course LED based. Uh, but you can also use a, a lampshade. Um, the easiest way to put a lampshade on is this sort of uh, construction where you just uh, uh, clip it on to the, to the light bulb like this and then you adjust it and uh, that gives it a beautiful light, I think. There's also another kind that uh, you screw on to, um, to the fitting. You just need to unscrew the upper part and you put it on and you screw uh, the top part on again. Um, it all depends on, on the sort of uh, life shape that, uh, that you get. So that concludes it. I managed to make the light bulb and I hope that you get inspiration. Um, probably need to adjust a little bit to get it perfectly centered. Um, if you did, Please subscribe, like, share, um, write a comment if you have a comment. Maybe you even have a suggestion for how you can do this in a different way, a better way maybe even. I hope to see you soon again.